first become aware of death? I know you guys tape traded and stuff like that, but how did you even come in contact with Chuck in the first place? You know, I was just a part of the tra tape trading scene. We all were a bunch of pen pals just sending each other demos. And I can't remember how or who sent me death's demo, but it might have been Borvoy or something. I can't even remember at this point, but um, I think it was, I mean, I remember Mantis, you know, and then I remember, I can't remember which was the, the demo. Was it Infernal Death that mm. had zombie ritual? And that was like the the demo before Scream Bloody Gore. Right, right. Um, and then I remember just really loving that demo. And then it was like, or maybe even Chuck sent it to me because he was part of the tape trading scene. We were all just like really into that and just sharing each other's bands and excited about underground music. So I think it was my friend Steve a mutual friend of kind of, I guess he kind of knew Chuck peripherally. And back then, you know, it was either snail mail or phone calls. So phone numbers would go around. And uh, I think Steve, a friend from here who, who kind of knew Chuck, just gave me his number one day and just was like, you should call him, you know, because he you know, knew I was a fellow guitar player and stuff. And I, I think I just cold called him one day and he answered the phone and either he did or his mom. Right. I mean, it's like a, that first call. I can't even remember because we talked a lot um, after that and just forged a friendship. And I had gone up there and would play guitar with him and sent each other more music. And I told him about Cynic and my stuff. And so we were just like buddies, you know, he was like an older brother in a sense for me. And then I think once he realized that I could actually play and that I was a serious musician, it, you know, the relationship kind of took a different kind of turn where we, he actually asked me, I think it was when he first parted with Rick Roz after leprosy, kind of in the midst of leprosy, I think he um, had asked me to help with some dates in Mexico. I was still in high school, you know, mm -hmm. and um and I missed my high school graduation. I remember like the ceremony, you know, whatever, because <laughs> I had to go do this, these shows and it blew my mind to um, get to Mexico and see how big death were because I had no idea, you know, what kind of what was going on with them yeah. really. And but you get to Mexico and they were like, it was like Beatlemania over there, man. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's just crazy fans. and. Had you done many people. shows with Cynic before that? Oh, yeah, tons. We had been playing gigs regularly since we were kids. Okay. You know, Cynic, Cynic started so young. So we had done from house parties to venues. And even just last night, I went to a friend's gig here on South Beach um, in Miami Beach, where I am. And we kind of were hanging out at this bar right next to the bar where my friend was playing. And it was literally across the street from the Cameo Theater, which is one of the places that we did our first real big gigs and opened for bands like Dark Angel and mm. like all these. We got I got in with the promoter and he would kind of let us open shows and we did these just different kinds of gigs i mean from the almost i'd say mid 80s you know i mean we were literally like 14 15 years old 16 yeah. you know so that was uh yeah and then I, I i did that show with him and i know i remember eric the greif at the time was his manager and i remember him saying chuck would like you to join the band you know are you interested in and i was so loyal to sean and um cynic that I said, I can't, I can't, I'm doing, this is my baby. Um, and, um, this is what I want to do. So, but it was done in a way that was lovingly, you know, and, um, and with kindness. So I think Chuck just kept me in my back pocket, you know, and, and that was kind of the idea was that I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I just can't commit. Cause really it was like back then now people, I think, will be in four bands and somehow manage it. But um, back then it was like a different headspace, I yeah. think, to just do what I mean. Well, now you could get on the internet and, and trade songs back and forth. Exactly. Back then you probably had to drive to wherever, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, Chuck was like four hours north of Miami. Yeah, yeah. So it was a different, yeah, it was a different thing. And 
as tempting as it was to be in a much more established band, it felt like, you know, I as an artist and songwriter myself was like, wait, I want to do my thing. I want to do my sound. Yeah. And I, you know, you felt more of like session role at the, in that sense with, with Chuck because it was like his vision, his his world. And, yeah. um, and I s- totally loved supporting his world and being a part of it, but I just knew I had my own music to write. So we, but he did ended up calling me back. You know, we stayed in touch. He did spiritual healing. I guess they started touring that. And then at some point that was right before everything imploded with the whole situation when I think the whole band kind of imploded and he kicked James out. And then part of devastation did dates to finish the tour. (laughs) And it was like that whole scenario. And Right, like right before it kind of turned to that corner, Chuck, I think right when James was gone, he said, can you go, can you do some dates for me? It was like in Texas or something. And I remember Devastation, I think we shared a bus with them. So we um, we did that and I did those shows. So I had kind of, so, you know, I was kind of connected musically to Chuck through these eras, right? From mm-hmm. leprosy to spiritual healing and then of course, to human. Um, and I was such a fan. I mean, always a huge fan of Chuck's and his music and Scream Bloody Gore was just like, to me, like such an incredibly catchy death metal. It's like, it was like pop death metal. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, I, exactly. Yep. Just like such memorable little ditties and these catchy riffs and these cool phrases, the way he's, you know, his vocal phrasing and so it was just really kind of I felt like he was really kind of the top of the, the the food chain there with that that sound. It was much more refined, you know, and polished. I mean, obviously, Possessed were doing some amazing things and other bands. But uh, Chuck was definitely right there. and He had his own niche and his own sound. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it kind of organically led to human. And it was curiously we were like kind of already active as an underground band cynic was releasing demos i think we had made our 91 demo um i can't remember what month we did that but that was the demo that led to focus the the roadrunner uh demo you're talking about yeah Yeah, the roadrunner demo and uh so that really kind of it was around then obviously because that's the same year we made human that um i think i was just in touch with chuck more often I knew that he was going through things and he basically, and I think there's an interview with him on Headbangers Ball or something from back in the day because I've seen clips of this or people have sent it to me where he said, uh, you know, I went to my friends right. to help, help me out. And those friends were really first me and Steve, who he had a relationship from even further back, going back to his California era of all that, you know, with Chris Reifert and all that stuff. So, so yeah. So then, and I urged Chuck, I think he was like looking for a drummer. I know he had composed a lot of, you know, he probably had half of human demoed before we even got in a room with him. But the demos were very crude in the sense that a Chuck demo was, and I think they put that on one of the reissues. They're like literally just a series of riffs rarely vocals on it that would just lead up to like whatever the bridge or the guitar solo section was and his approach to a lot of arrangements was like just repeat from there and copy you know yeah. paste kind of thing and um so the arrangements were very like just get the first two minutes and then you've got the rest of the song kind of thing okay. you just and um i think that developed over the years and he started to refine and even with human we took that into consideration because we were of the mindset that an arrangement should evolve from the beginning to the end and completely expand and new things should be introduced when you repeat things and things like that so i think some of that became part of chuck's language and you started to hear it on records like human where there was like a different harmony or a twist on a section yeah 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 was he was he open to some of those ideas then, like when you guys did bring that kind of stuff up? Yeah, completely. Like, you know, as I said, like his demos were so crude mm-hmm. that it felt like we started from scratch by the time we got in the room. And I had I had remembered him like, you know, the drummer thing. And I just basically just said, you've got to consider Sean. You know, Sean is um, 
Sean's the man. And I don't know that he had ever seen Sean play, you know, or like, I can't remember there being like an audition officially as much as maybe there was just some jam at some point. Yeah. Or he had heard enough of our demos maybe to realize like, wow, this guy, this yeah. guy knows what he's doing. But it was like, I thought that was that when it, to me, it was like the perfect thing because Sean and I had such incredible chemistry that we could now work together and bring what we had already developed in, in the context of cynic into the death sound. Um, and Chuck was, yeah, he was receptive. I, I found that we could push things to a point, like we went as far as we could <laughs> and yeah. sometimes we'd go too far and he would pull it back. I think he was, you know, had certain parameters in mind mm -hmm. and was always acting as producer in terms of, what he saw, because I think it had to resonate with his own creative self. He couldn't just let these, you know, crazy <laughs> ripper musicians come yeah. in and change his whole world, you know? So we kind of brought ourselves to it. And I, you know, Sean, especially foundationally, drums being such the whole way that a band feels. I mean, it's literally the, the most important instrument, essentially, in a rock band in terms of the root of how everything sits. Mm -hmm. And you know, Sean was prodigious. And by the time he was playing, you know, death human stuff, he was peak powers. Yeah. So it was like he could do whatever he wanted. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he so he played as much as he could and did a lot of expressive things. And I think there's a clip in I can't remember some interview of Sean's that either our friend Phil made that drum talk doc about Sean, where it's like Gene and Thomas from a sugar talking about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's like, I think it's that or some other clip somewhere where Sean mentions, you know, how he had one point had done this, you know, time signature, an odd time signature over a really straight kind of sounding death riff. And Chuck kind of like, didn't understand what to do. And Sean was like, just keep playing what you're playing. Stay, <laughs> keep, keep thinking four, four and I, you'll be okay. And it was like, he was showing them how to like, not overthink you know what i mean yeah, it's all, yeah. it was almost like what happens a lot of times in in now gent music right you're mm -hmm. kind of superimposing you know playing over the bar line kind of ideas and stuff and we were so into all that stuff so it was it was um it was just cool to see chuck being willing to like let that happen and and take it as far as he could and, and in, in the end i think it you know it resulted in something really cool for death that felt linear it felt like in line with i mean it's if you look at his records there was just this progression and human really kind of had something that was like it made sense yeah, you know what i mean for sure um, and that probably helped too like like you said like it's probably a, a balancing act coming into like an established band and and then trying to figure out like what how much can i add or how you know what's too much exactly. like you said but it probably helped that you were on, a, you know, you guys were friends. You had a, at least an established relationship. You played with them, so you probably could read them a little bit more and, and figure out what totally. you could do. I'm guessing. Oh yeah, I mean that's part of it. I so much of of this kind of thing in a band is built on trust mm -hmm. and and really just like get, keeping egos out of the way, right? And really saying we're all in the best interest of the music. We're here for your for your music to serve these songs and. That was, I think we had established that and he had that trust in us and he felt like he was in really good hands and, and he was really driven by this, like he was, you know, it was a very retaliative record in a sense because he felt so betrayed mm -hmm. by the band that I, and I, I know those guys were just doing what they needed to do. I mean, it was a weird situation. I don't know the whole story, but. I'm sure promoters were yelling. There was money at stake. It was yeah. commitments. People were going to get screwed. They just did what they needed to do. And they were just trying to kind of save face. And, um, but of course, it's just such a layered environment that, but Chuck got enraged and really it kind of fueled him in a sense. Like he was just like his middle finger to the past in mm -hmm. a sense. Like, wait till you hear my new music kind of thing. And so he had that like, which is, you know, I, I guess a constructive use of, of anger and rage. He found a way to kind of pour it into a creative process and make a really intense record by his own intuition, knowing to get 
these guys in, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, so yeah, that, even I mean, um, could have even Terry. I talked to Terry, you know, for the last episode, and he kind of said he's like one one good thing about us doing that was he felt like it maybe it fueled Chuck a little bit, yeah, to kind of like you know light a fire and give him that motivation to do the to do human which hey you know at least something yeah good came out of like you said a good use of that anger exactly yeah yeah that's interesting that's very interesting with sean when he when he when chuck started seeing what sean could do and all that and 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 just his talent with it did like when did sean get that good like when you guys were playing with cynic i i'm very familiar with the 91 demo i'm not as familiar with the other demos but when did sean get you know that good was, was he pushed during the, the the recording for that album or was he already there yeah you know sean was you know truly anomalous as a as a drummer as a as a child musician that had this background in piano and then went but always wanted to play drums and i think when he went for his first drum lesson you know i mean, you know this the story goes or something that he the teacher had played like a police song, you know, Stuart Copeland was pl- known for playing kind of more complex rhythms. And I've told this story before, but like, it was like, he was considered a more sophisticated drummer in a pop context. Like, and Sean said to the teacher first lesson, like, I understand what he's doing kind of thing. I know. And the teacher at that point realized, holy shit, I, I, I don't even know if I can teach you. Like, you know, like he kind of just had this karmic imprint of like, he just understood how drums worked so he was always very advanced in terms of understanding on multiple levels what to do with the instrument and then all it took was him woodshedding and practicing to implement like higher and higher levels of technique and sophistication and so he was to me you know as a kid when i look back all those years it was like sean could do anything i could just hum these grooves any idea i had in my head he could just bust it out like it was like nothing mm. to him. So there was no boundaries in terms of musical. Like I never felt confined or limited with him musically. He he just was kind of infinite prowess and right. ability and skills. So and I think because we actually came up together in terms of our musicality. But yeah, I would say by the time 91 human, he was you know 20 years old. I think he might have even been 19 when we made the record, but he was like completely just had just done so much of his homework, had such facility from all those years of practicing and all the things that we were doing in the context of Cynic and everything else he was doing. Cause we were, he was also cutting demos for people and friends, bands and mm. weird side jazz projects and fusion and funk groups. I mean, he could, he was like, not just a metal rock guy, you know, he actually always dipped his toe in other things. But um, he brought all that into the context of a metal band. And especially in the context of a more extreme band like a death, it was like, whoa, what is this? What is, <laughs> what is this drummer doing? You know, where does he yeah. come from? I, yeah. I made a joke when we were when we were talking about this album. It's like, I feel like, man, I, I could have wrote some riffs for this album and between what Sean is doing and then even what Steve is doing, it's like he probably could have made my riffs sound pretty like pretty badass, which oh, I, yeah. it's not actually true. But I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like the way he added to every riff and would 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 change the songs as they went, you know, you could hear him just kind of doing things differently as the song would go on. And I feel like it, it gives it so much listenability because you go back and you hear different things every time and it just adds exactly. this layer to it that's just amazing. Yeah, that's it. And that's just, that's what happens when you get higher, you know, bet more skilled musicians who are more in service of the music than themselves, right? They're just like, like Sean Malone was like that for me too, the, you know, the scenic bass player, mm-hmm. just like absolute master, highest level musician, like just genius player who could just, I'd hand him a riff idea and he'd hand back you know, seven versions of how he could approach it. And it would like each one was completely different. Like it would just turn the riff on its head. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, and Reiner used to always joke that Malone made him him sound better. He was right. like, Malone makes me sound better. So we were all in awe of him as well. So, but yeah, those precedents, you know, you put yourself, unless you're in a more politically driven band, like a punk aesthetic or something where it's not so musicianship based, 
I do think there's a fine line because you get musicians that overplay, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. over. And Sean always, I think because he had that background from classic rock and real songwriting music that he had that understanding to not overdo it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, for like, sure. I mean, it, it's it maybe back then some people were like, that's too busy. But now you listen to those drums and it doesn't compared to a lot of drummers. Now it's, it's not that busy. It's just, he's just doing what's right, you yeah. know, for the part. And so, yeah, it's really, um, it was a really interesting kind of organic flow of events. And I think it really worked out. It was a beautiful thing for Chuck because I think it also opened the door for him moving forward to just like, Oh, I can mix this up. Yeah. I can bring in different musicians and, see what they bring to the table and it'll help my my songs evolve or sound like they're evolving to a degree you know what i mean oh, like yeah. kind of cuz you're you're changing the entire framework around it so um so yeah it's really i think it became it opened that possibility for chuck and people started to realize yeah this is not just like a band band it's like it's this guy mm, and yeah. his vision i wanted to ask too uh, w- when you stepped in you know, because you came after James Murphy, who kind of got a lot of credit for that last album with his leads and everything else. Did you, were you thinking about that at all? You know, was there any pressure with that? Oh, no. I mean, I loved James. I mean, all those guys. I think Rick Ross served a really interesting purpose. He was such a whammy bar guy and he had his, his, like that almost Carrie King Slayer ish mm-hmm. kind of approach, which, you know, early obituary had that. It was, I feel like there's certain death metal bands to this day that stay true to that aesthetic, maybe push the envelope with it more. But I understand the logic of that, like, because there was a lot of people, especially when Cause of Death came out, they're like, wait, you can't play neoclassical type solos over this stuff. Like, what are <laughs> right. you doing? And I think they said that maybe with spiritual healing, but I thought James was great. And I, I thought what he was doing was really cool. And I loved hearing a more melodic bent to to such brutal music and spiritual healing was such a weird record in how it was produced to me it was so cool it was so dry right the vocals Mm -hmm. were so in your face it was like barely any effects or something you know it was just like god that voice is just like right here um but yeah i thought james was fantastic and i I never really viewed it as a competition, mm-hmm. dude. I mean, I was such a different player yeah. and coming from a different background that I, I thought, you know, I was just excited to participate and, and be able to do my thing in the context of, of, of the, these types of songs. Which, I mean, um, then that first song when it kicks in, I mean, I, flattening the emotions, that solo that you do on that one. I mean, that's such a great solo to me because I mean, I guess you really know when it's a good solo, when it gets stuck in your head, you know, instead of just being that part of the song that has to be there. And whenever yours kicks in and it just kind of flies off, you know, I, I love that. Like, how, how did that one come together? Did you did you p- p- spend much time on that or, or what was the story with that? Yeah, I mean, for me, like a lot of these solos, you know, and this is the cu- true for Cynic and a lot of projects is that I do, I generally just improvise over the I, you know, I learn whatever the chord progression or the changes are. And, and with death music, it's often very chromatic as well. A lot of these half steppy kind of death riffs. So you have to pay attention, right? It's like, oh, wait, it's G sharp, not G here mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. But I would just improvise ideas and then kind of almost like see what felt best. It's like a matter of like trial and error over and over and over. You just keep playing and playing and okay, I've got the first 10 seconds. Now, where's this going from here? And one of my tricks was I would draw often, I haven't done this in a while, but I would draw like on a piece of paper, like a line, like almost like a graph or a shape in terms of what I wanted the the solo to sound like, Mm. you know, like, like almost like giving it a visual aesthetic just to kind of, okay, it's going to peak here and then it's going to drop down and go into something more spacious. And then maybe like with more like, you know, holding notes out and then a, a busier passage and it would, it would look like a scribbly line and then an <laughs> it op- makes a long line. Yeah. And so that was like one of the things I used to do. And so it was like a combination of that kind of stuff along with actually just playing it over and over and kind of little by little finding the sections as, as it came along. And then you kind of get, get this overall arrangement for the solo 
and then it kind of I finesse it. I just play it until I, it's like you just fine tune it and get get the if, get you know what I mean. Make it yeah. feel really natural and but um but yeah, that's kind of been my approach for years. Unless it's just like a quick improvisational thing, because there was a lot of moments on Cynic Records where it was just like that was a one take and okay. I was. I left it kind of yeah. thing and um and just let it be even though it maybe wasn't perfect and there may have been a little bit of stuff technique wise that I felt like uh, insecure about I was just like I don't think I can capture that energy again I have to just leave that alone right, right. and um That's so true. yeah it's, yeah exactly it's just kind of but yeah that was a really cool you know it was that was so it was always fun soloing over death songs especially by the time we did human, because I really felt like I felt comfortable too, as a soloist and doing, you know, kind of ma- doing things that I knew had my own weird hybridized sounds. Right. So I was like, Oh, cool. I can do this weird stuff over Chuck's more straight rhythms and stuff. You yeah. Know? yeah. So, oh yeah. It adds so much. What the other one that I was just super curious about <clears throat> is uh cosmic C, which, you know, that's the one that just to me sounds the most, cynicky you know to, to put it in, mm-hmm. in a bad term but you know it's so different from anything death had done and i mean it stands out in the album and it's such a special track on the album to me because it it does really get so much more expansive i mean how did that one come together for you guys well that song really was i mean it's like a, one of those things that we had a break in the studio we had time actually what it was i think was that we suddenly found ourselves with time because Sean, when we booked uh, the studio for for Human, they gave like Sean a week to cut drums. It was like, and which was incredible because we never even, you know, we'd we'd cut drums in a day for things. You know, it was just oh, like wow. Sean would just have. But it was like, wow, we get a week. We felt like we were really spoiled. And Sean cut all his drums, I think, in like two days or something for Human. And Crazy. Yeah, it was just like all just happened fast. I mean, Sean had this ability to just turn that on and nail nail takes. Like he was just, you know, he just had that kind of mastery. He could just execute and concentrate and just nail it. And and so we were suddenly found ourselves with all this extra time at some point, you know, towards the end of us where we started cutting bass and guitars. And, and it was like, oh, what do we do? We've got all this. And it was like, oh, let's do an instrumental. So Chuck was like started, I think he was in the background at some point developing something. And it turned into this song that got written essentially in the studio and became like, like, so I think I just literally had like, this is your solo section. This is Chuck's solo section. Now we're going to trade off at the end. You know, mm-hmm. we did that kind of with the reverse weird sounds and, but um, so it just kind of happened. Like it was really a result of having spare time. I think Human may have ended up being a seven song album if if uh, if Sean hadn't cut his drum so fast right. or maybe Chuck had another idea up his sleeve. But it's such a unique song. I mean, did Chuck have any like reservations or like, oh, well, this is too out there? You know, because I know, like you said, he usually kind of wrote in that in that, um, you know, more standard, you know, verse. Yeah. Verse chord, you know, all that kind of stuff like this was such a departure, you know? Right. Yeah, maybe that was just like, you know, a, a lot of input from us, just like opening things up and having that bass breakdown moment and yeah. do what I mean. And then that whole sound design thing that we did with one of the guys at Morris Sound. And it was just like, I think, you know, even the title Cosmic Sea, I'll tell you, came, I could swear to you, it came from, I used to, I was really into like, at the time, a lot of Hindu philosophy stuff. And I was reading a lot of besides the Bhagavad Gita and the books of the Mahabharata and all that, I was into like a, one of the guys that brought a lot of that stuff to the West and his name was Paramahansa Yogananda. And he, um, I would have these little books of his, like these little kind of manual booklets that would just like be one of his Dharma talks essentially about some point of view. And I, there was a book called Cosmic Sea. Mm. And cause I even used it in a lyric of a cynic song called I'm but a wave to so I swear, like that was around, and I, I'm, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, of course he picked that up from seeing that. You know what I mean? It <laughs> yeah. was like, and so I think it was in some ways also a nod to like, look, I've got these killer musicians. Like, why don't I take advantage and do an instrumental for the first time? Right. You know, like I can really stretch out and and take a break from a vocal song, 
So I think he had the, the, the confidence to actually do an instrumental, which probably wasn't that common back then either in the, in that context no. of, of that music. So yeah, there's a lot of factors to consider there, but um, it was a pretty cool spontaneous thing that happened in the studio. And yeah, for me, mo- the mute, the solo is probably the most emotional solo. You know, it feels very like from the heart, mm-hmm. you know, like it just has a, it just, yeah, it feels to me like I'm, co- I'm really saying something very heart driven. It's, so it kind of reached into something nice for me that um, I can't even put into words, yeah. really. You know? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I totally get it. It makes sense. So at that point, you know, I know you guys, that was, you guys still had Cynic. That was your baby. You're going back to that. How much, and I mean, maybe it didn't at all, you know, I would think in some way, like how, how much did that time with death, you know, whether it was recording the album or, you know, touring or any of that kind of stuff. Like how much did that color the songwriting for focus? Like, did it impact that in some way? Yeah. I mean, first off, I would say if you hear the cynic 91 demo, like, you know, that was me at like when I finally like found my voice and lost it as a growler, I was like, Mm. I was somewhere between, you know, Schuldiner and Becerra, you know, (laughs) like that was like, like it was finally, I was like, I got the sound I wanted, you know? And, um, But then I destroyed my voice because I was just really belting and I didn't have that like control and I didn't have that like thing that a lot of those growlers have that just they just have this interesting way of finding a technique to do it without destroying your voice. I just didn't. It was not meant to be for me. But I think like obviously and then I got Tony, you know, to growl on the record and Tony I knew from Epitaph and the reason why I loved his voice and I always loved those old school tardy, that range of that kind of voice was my favorite to this day Mm -hmm. in terms of a death metal growl. I just love that with the long notes and just like, you know, I remember what's his name from Morgoth had that sound. There was a bunch of people and, um, you know, obviously hearing tardy for the first time back in the day, was just like, Whoa, okay, this is next level. You know, like, (laughs) I mean, just, insane but um so i think vocally for sure like there was always that like reference point you know and i think it was rooted in becerra and chuck in terms of like i love that vocal style and i think tony had that sound like maybe a slightly witchier you know but Mm -hmm. just really right on the edge of just perfect balanced brutality and absolute control and he also like tony was interesting and especially on focus in that he like he sang from the heart. I mean, he literally would like touch his heart and like, while, you know, I was showing him the lyrics and just belting in the studio, like he really came from a different place than like rage, Mm -hmm. you know, it was Mm -hmm. like more just like, you know, it's like heart driven growls. It's hard to explain that. It's a perfect fit too. Yeah. For that. Yeah. I mean, that's really the sound and from where he was like, what he, cause the words he was saying, he wasn't singing about things that, you had to be pissed about it was it was like spiritual topics and meditation and things yeah, you know yeah so i think the vocal sound definitely has that root in in the death influence and inspiration and just being around chuck and hearing him sing so intimately in the studio and knowing that it always like had an impression on me and, and played a big role and then there was just a certain stylism in Death's music that you can hear, you know, to this day in some of Cynic's riffs, which is this, just that 16th note, digga, 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 you know, like we just sometimes will, ours will be probably a more complex thing, but it's like that space is there. And it's, it definitely was rooted in a sound that I think Death kind of really kind of developed and became signature so there's like moments i think in cynics music where you can go there's a kind of deathy death vibe Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. it's i mean it was always weirdly layered or something or some other component that would go go on that would make it different but i can hear it i know if anybody else can (laughs) but i'm like oh yeah that's definitely a little death vibe right there you know um so yeah so there's definitely that kind of played a role and it was Probably as a, again as a result of being in such close proximity, first of being a fan and then being around him and actually participating on a record, it felt like we were just honoring a lineage, right? Mm-hmm. That we were a part of. Yeah. So I don't want to take too much of your time here. I mean, I could, 
I could go into, we could talk about Cynic forever. I'd love to get into some of your, I know some of your spirituality stuff and all that. I've listened to other interviews and it's just all. Yeah, maybe we could do another chat yeah. on the Cynic thing sometime. That's what I was going to sure. say. Maybe, you know, you got the reissue coming out and yeah, next year, maybe totally. we can get back in touch so you can, you know, we can talk straight up about just Cynic and all that other stuff because, you know, I, I love Focus. I love Cynic. So, um, so just be awesome. awesome. Okay. So, well, uh, like I said, I, like I said, I really appreciate it. You know, the, the giving us some extra contacts and info and awesome, you know, so maybe we can, uh, maybe we can do it again get into cynic and all that stuff, you know, for sure. Jason, excited for that. Chatting with you. Yeah. 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 It's a full, full remix from the ground up and it's sounding so fierce and intense. I'm so excited about it. It's like really cool. It's kind of pushing it into a, a whole new realm that's awesome. So, yeah. Cool. Well, good luck but, with finishing um, it, man. Thank you, man. And good luck with, uh, I hope you feel better yeah. or get some rest and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, whatever you need. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Hit me up whenever, man. Like that, that reissue thing won't come out till probably sometime in the middle and even maybe next summer or fall. Okay. You know, it's like we're, we're almost a year off at this point. So right, right. we got plenty of time, but Perfect. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great to chat with you again. Awesome, man. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. You too, brother. Take right. care, Jason. Yep. Bye-bye.